Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Time is now 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Want to first and foremost thank everybody for joining us for today's TMC Connect web broadcast entitled Social Media Compliance Monitoring Knows No Social Distancing. And it's led today by our friends and longtime partners at MQMR. Uh, if you go ahead and proceed to the next slide for me. Um, just in the run up to today's discussion, a uh, couple things to review real quick. First and foremost, I want to remind our members on today's call to check out our TMC Connect and member event calendar pages on the Mortgage Collaborative website to view a schedule of our upcoming TMC Connect broadcast. And definitely encourage you to continue to check in as uh, constantly updating and adding some new great interactive sessions uh, to the docket for our discussions. And for example, we've had uh, you know, nine broadcasts in total for this week and plan to have a similar amount of discussions in the coming weeks. I uh, also want to encourage our members to check out a pair of TMC member benefits. Uh, first and foremost, Ask TMC, which is our message board forum to, uh, you know, for resources and best practices uh, for essentially our members to inquire and leverage the collective power of the network for any inquiries they may have about uh, you know, best running their operations, uh, as well as our TMC benchmark solution, which provides our members over 40 key performance metric indicators on a monthly basis, uh, allows them to provide actionable insights to help run their businesses more effectively and more profitably. Uh, before jumping into the discussion, just a couple brief rules for engagement on today's call. Uh, first and foremost, whether you dial in or you're connected via your computer, all lines have been muted for this discussion. And it's done only to avoid background noise in your area and ensure that all of our attendees can clearly hear today's presentation. And I really want this discussion to be as interactive as possible. So I highly encourage our attendees, you know, please feel free to submit questions that you have throughout the discussion. And we will go ahead and verbalize those with our discussion leaders towards the tail end of today's call. Uh, to submit those questions, you can do so via either the chat function or the Q&A box, both of which are accessible at the bottom of your screen, uh, menu options. And today's call will be recorded and available for playback. Uh, instructions to access a copy of the recording as well as a copy of the presentation deck will be distributed to all attendees in a follow-up email that you should receive either later today or tomorrow. Uh, let's proceed to the next slide. So leading today's discussion, uh, we have from MQMR, uh, Michael Barone, Executive Director of Compliance and General Counsel for MQMR. Hey, Michael, how are you? Very good, thank you, Tom. Thank you, sir. And then also leading today's discussion is Dana Silver, who is Director of Strategic Initiatives at MQMR. Hi, Dana. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure to have you. And uh, really grateful to you both for taking the time out of your busy schedules to help lead today's discussion. Um, so on that note, I want to go ahead and turn things over to Michael so we can go ahead and jump right in. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending upon where you are, and hopefully you're all staying as safe as possible. Um, so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to take the first part of the webinar and speak um, about compliance and some of the practical considerations with social media, and then Dana is going to speak um, and show us some alternatives and, and some ways in which uh, you're able to monitor um, the transactions on social media between your employees. So, you know, the, the top of the, the screen, and I love to start it this way, with why all the fuss? Because I do get that question a lot and not necessarily using the word fuss, but, you know, what's the big deal with social media? And the easiest way to answer that is, is that social media is advertising. And I think a lot of lenders, banks, IMBs have the um, process locked down. When you have advert print advertising, co-marketing, co-branded advertisements, anything like that, where they are submitted to compliance, there is a marketing department, there is a process where those things are approved before they go out into the, the marketplace for, for consumer view and um, you know, regulators to see and everything else. Um, I don't think that that same holds true when, with social media. I mean, social media, you can have a loan officer sitting at home at midnight after having a few drinks or who knows what else, right? And jumping on there on on the internet, jumping on you know one of their platforms, and start 
talking or communicating. And for some reason, there's the connect between this being advertisement, being an advertisement that I need to get reviewed by compliance as compared to when you have print advertising, that connection is not there. It's just not. They don't think of it the same way, um, whether it's a loan officer or someone else in your, in, your, in your organization, they don't think of it the same way. So when they go on their Facebook page, their LinkedIn, their Twitter, their YouTube, they're not thinking of it the same way as a co-branded advertisement that I now have to go and get reviewed by compliance. It doesn't click that way. And that's why it's the fuss. It's very, very dangerous for a lender because even though they're communicating, it's looked at as they're communicating on the lender's behalf and the lender's always left with that realization that if they do something wrong, they're gonna come back to them. That's just the way it is, whether it's fair or it's not. If they're going on there and they're talking about something that's a RESPA violation, they're talking about something that's a TILA violation, it's gonna come back to the lender. So that's the big fuss, is lenders want a way to monitor and control what their employees are saying on social media, the same way they're monitoring and controlling what is being said in print advertisement, radio advertisement, TV advertisement, a co-branded advertisement, whatever it may be. That's the fuss is how do we make get it so that we can protect ourselves on all these social media communications that are coming like crazy, all the platforms, the use of it, people getting more used to it. Um, it's just coming. So they need to protect themselves there. And that's, that's why you have the fuss with social media and, and lenders concerned with monitoring it and what could be happening that they don't know about. Um, so in 2013, I know it's a while back, but it's still pretty looked at, it's still looked at commonly by regulators, the FFIEC issued some social media guidance. And again, it's not a regulation, it's just guidance, but it is looked at by regulators and it does give some a nice framework for a lender to look at. And, and what, do they, what do they talk about? It talks about a risk management plan and what does that entail? It involves the things that are, are bullet pointed here, senior management involvement, you know, they want governance, they want a structure, they want clear roles defined, policies and procedures. You know, what can they do? What can't they do? How do you get approval to do something, right? Um, certain things that might not be allowed no matter what, certain things that might be allowed no matter what, but have those things there for your, for your uh, employees in a written document. Um, training, again, someone may not read that 12 page social media, um, social media policy or procedure, but have some training, mandatory training, right? They gotta go, they gotta take a test, right? It enforces it a little bit more um, they want oversight by a qualified individual. Many times it's someone in the compliance department. They want some auditing and, uh, and monitoring, which is the testing, which Dana is going to talk a lot about. But again, you need a way to making sure that those policies and procedures are being followed. People are getting uh, approval for what they say, or they're not, they're saying things that don't require approval, whatever that may be. And then they want the circle to be completed when they're, when they're reporting it back to senior management. That's the complete circle. It starts with senior management involvement. It ends with senior management being involved in terms of what is going on. Are the results good? Are the results bad? If the results are bad, what are we doing about it? If the results are good, maybe we're, we're lessening up on the, on the monitoring a little bit because people seem to be following what they're doing. But that's really what they want. It's not a one size fits all um, type of, of plan. Different companies have different uh, business strategies. They use social media in different ways. So it's not something you carve out one size fits all. Different lenders have this, different risk tolerances. It all plays into it. It's even stated right in the guidance. There's no one size fits all plan policy here or, or risk management plan. So, but it's important that you start thinking about these things if you haven't already and you, you will go back and you rethink them when need be. No less than annually, but if circumstances in your company change, uh, you might want to look at them again. But that's what you really need. You need to uh, internally come up with some type of plan on how you're going to manage the risk of social media uh, advertising or social media communications with your employees. Okay, moving on. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, social media, the medium is not relevant, right? If you're promoting a commercial message, it's an advertisement under Tiller under most state laws, and therefore all the advertising rules kick in. Right, so if you see a sign, ABC Mortgage, right, um, or someone, John Smith, says I'm a loan originator, ABC Mortgage, those are not promoting a commercial message, right? But you start saying, call me for your, for, I'm sorry, for your lending needs, or we have great rates, or however you want to say it. Once you start promoting that, that commercial message and trying to attract traffic, all right, that's when you have a commercial message where the advertising rules kick in. Sometimes there's gray areas there, but just in, to try and make it black and white for you. 
Um, and what are some some common mistakes just running these down? Is there something that came off to the, the top of my head? Not not putting the MLS number of the LO or the lender, uh, indicating the lender they work for, right? Someone can't go out and advertise on their own because they don't have a lending license to, to lend on their own. So you have to indicate that you are working through a licensed lender. Um, use of unapproved names, right? Things that DBAs that are not approved either by the banking department or the state. Um, you have misleading statements, government affiliations when you shouldn't without the proper disclosures, state licensing information. You have about half the states that require particular information, uh, the name of the state sometimes, the name of the, the agency, the name of the license number, uh, and some other things. So you see that um, certain things you never use in the word, the words expert, counselor, superlatives, best, lowest, fastest are always you know things to stay away from. Um, I threw envelopes on here. That's not social media, but it's always a pet peeve of mine because there is so much deception in, in envelopes when you're advertising. I just figured I'd throw that in. You know, I love when you ask, well, why aren't you putting the return address or the return name of the lender on your advertisement? Well, I want them to open it. And if they see the lender's name, they're not going to open it. Um, it sounds like a little deception to me, but that's not really what social media is about. There's no envelopes with social media, but again, it's just something that always, always, um, um, rub me the wrong way. Um, in, in essence, the full facts, right? You, you, you're not going on there saying I closed the loan at 3%, right? You got to go on and say I closed the loan at 3%. What was the LTV? What was the DTI? What was the FICO? Was it a 10-year arm, right? Were they pay, did they play two discount points? You know, all that stuff is relevant when you start boasting that you closed the loan at 3% today, not to mention the APR. So, you know, sometimes People do things and they're rogue and they do things and they know that they're doing things wrong and they don't care. And sometimes they just don't know. So you can have a loan officer that says, I closed the loan at 3% today, right? And they say, well, what's wrong with that? I did, I did it, I, I did. Here's the, here's the note, here's the LE, here's the CD. You're right, you did. But again, you didn't tell them all those other facts or all those circumstances this person had, right? That someone else may not have. 15 year arm, two down, two discount points. I mean, come on, that's that's all relevant if you close the loan at 3% because someone else can't get that same loan at 3% unless they, they have X, Y, and Z. So that's the type of things that, you know, you would certainly have to disclose. But those are just some common mistakes. Flipping over, uh, you know, what can you do, right? Going to the next slide, you know, you can do an advertisement that follows all the advertising rules. Some lenders actually take a position you can't advertise on social media, or maybe you don't want to deal with that. Maybe you don't want to deal with going back to compliance and, and the, whatever it may be. So what can I do outside of advertising? You know, again, it's only if you're promoting a, a commercial message do you have to follow all those advertising rules. So, you know, what can you do? Well, you can share articles. There's plenty of, of organizations and individuals that do that on Facebook or so, or so forth. You go to some of the very big lenders, very, very big, Wells Fargo, for example, Bank of America, you go on their Facebook page, there's no promoting a commercial message. There's no t apply here button, right? There's no here are our rates, here are our programs. It's articles. How do you water your flowers in the spring? What's the difference between an arm and a fixed loan, right? All these types of articles and information out there that are not promoting a commercial message. It's more information, right? Information that you can get to a consumer and maybe make contact with them, right? So. All of that is, you know, you can do, sharing articles, sharing pictures of events, right, events that you might have done. Contests, right, you have state rules there, but, you know, possibly you can do some contests, random contests. Congratulating borrowers, got to watch out for privacy, but, you know, uh, Maureen and Jim uh, closed the, a loan today. Uh, personal achievements, it was my 500th loan closed, as long as that's accurate, right? You could tell your story as an LO. You could tell about your pre-call program, not asking them to apply, but tell about your program. So if you're giving information as opposed to promoting a commercial message, you don't have to follow all those advertising rules. Still can't be deceptive, need to be clear, not be misleading, be accurate, right? But there are things you can do on social media which do not trip the advertising requirements. Um, so the... Just be very careful with that. You always want to run it by compliance. But again, there are, just be aware that when you're outside of that com promoting a commercial message, you're outside of just about all the advertising rules. And there's things you can do, which again, can generate interest, can generate, be in front of people, can communicate with people, um, drive, drive traffic to all those types of things. So might not be the number one thing you want to do, or maybe it is, but it's an option. 
and something that takes a lot less compliance, a lot less rule following than than um, than if you were promoting a commercial message. Um, flipping to the next slide, I'm not gonna I'm gonna go through this real quick because Dana is gonna go through this on on her on her uh, when I'm done and going through some of the ways to monitor and what you look for. Um, but it's important, right? It's very important. Um, again, you want to determine whether it's an advertisement or a conversation, whether you have to follow the rules or not. You have privacy concerns, reputational risk concerns, the equal housing logo. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the advertising rules do not make exceptions if you have a limited amount of characters or a limited type of character. And if your social media platform can't make the, the equal housing logo, yeah, maybe you can write it out, but there's no exception for that. If you don't have enough characters to fit all the state disclosures, it doesn't mean you don't have to put them up there or choose the ones you think are most important, right? It means that you can't do that advertisement. Now, you may take a risk and do it, but by the letter of the law, you can't. If you're advertising on a platform, you need X, Y, and Z. It doesn't say except if your character's limit gets exceeded. It doesn't say that. So you need to have what you need to do. And if the platform doesn't allow it, you have to make a choice to be non-compliant or don't use that platform. All right, there's no, there's no middle ground there. Um, NMLS numbers we spoke about, trigger terms under TILA. You always want to be careful about APR. If you're listing a rate in an APR. Disclosures, make sure they're clear and conspicuous. Um, regulators are not happy these days when you're uh, the, the lion's share of your advertisement is in 14-point font, and the disclosure is in four-point font, right? They're not very happy with that because, again, it's deceiving on its face. Why is it in four-point font? Because you don't want people to read it. You want people to skip over it, right? So it's deceiving on its face, and that's a, a big spot with regulators right now. They want those disclosures to be clear and conspicuous. Uh, if you're doing, you know, if someone's doing joint advertising, you might pick up by monitoring. You want to make sure everyone's paying their pro rata share. Um, you have state-specific requirements we spoke about. The states require a license number and an agency on there. And any type of deception or misrepresentation, which, again, is subjective, can't really lay that out. Just to look at it and see, you know, would this be deceptive to the an ordinary person as opposed to someone that's in the, in the mortgage industry. And just want to add on there, I think, you know, DBAs and, and use of names outside of corporate approved names are, is always a big one as well. But there's a whole host of things, and these items that you monitor may change for every business because, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's got to go hand-in-hand -hand with your business plan. Um, you know, call centers are usually not going out and advertising on social media, call center LOs. So you just have to, you know, take into account what, what platforms you have, and there might be more risk on some than others, and there might be more risk in certain type of noncompliance than others that maybe you would stress items there more when you're monitoring. So it's something that has to be developed for your particular, um, for your particular organization. Um, next slide, just want to go through um, a couple more things, and then we'll turn it over to Dana um, to uh, look at some of the monitoring of ways to monitor. But this is a slide with, slide with seven deadly sins uh, for social media, and it's something that we did with a white paper on a while back, and you might have seen it, but I think it's important because it's, it's really good, and it's some things that are, you know, think you, it makes you think outside the box. Um, failure to maintain a risk management program or have, you know, not having a program at all, I see it a lot, right? And I see a lot of people that really don't monitor or they, they Google loan officers' names once a year. I mean, if you're doing it to check the box to show a regulator and you made that decision, then so be it. But if you're doing it to really catch people and to make sure your social media posts are compliant, that's not really a great idea to start Googling words one time a year, right? Um, so again, you have policies and procedures, you have training, you have senior management and volume, um, involvement, and you have uh, the monitoring going on, right? Um, and uh, one of my favorite sayings is all good until it's not. People say, oh, I have been doing, I haven't monitored social media for five years. I haven't had any problem. I'm not worrying about it now. No regulators ever said anything, right? It's all good until you get that knock on the door the next day or that letter in the mail the next day saying we filed these five posts on social media. I can, I can tell you numerous people that I've spoken to over the years that have said, I've said this advertisement is garbage. This advertisement should not be used. It's non-compliant. Here's the reasons. This is the way you can make it compliant. 
and they say, nope, I get a great response rate on this. We need this. My loan office would go crazy if I made these changes. We haven't been, no one's come to us in five years. I'm not worried about it, right? And I can't tell you how many of them got a letter from the CFPB a year later, two years later, saying, you know, this advertisement uh, is defective. Give me all your advertisements you've ever done. Tell us how you think this is non-deceptive. Where'd you get this number from? Where'd you derive this APR from? Um, it's all good until it's not, right? It's great to say I haven't been, a, nothing happened in five years. Something could happen tomorrow. So if you're not doing it compliantly, it's great. You haven't gotten caught, but, you know, who knows what's around the corner. Just I, I don't think that's a, a very good excuse to say I've been doing it for five years and no one said anything. Um, a failure to maintain a crisis communication plan. What if an employee posts something inappropriate, right? What if the media shows up on your door? What if community groups show up at your door? Right? What if the news is all of a sudden outside because someone in your organization posted something politically incorrect? Right? What are you going to do? I would think now is a good time to at least start thinking about that rather than when the news is casters are at your front door sticking a microphone in your face. Right? Maybe you don't finalize it now. Maybe you have some open issues depending upon what type of, of problem it is. But probably should start thinking about who's going to be involved in that and, and how you're going to handle that because it, it has happened. We've seen it happen. We've seen it with some really big companies where bonehead employees have, have made some type of comment, which was objected to by the general public. Um, next sin is failure to, failure to monitor your human resources department for compliance. Um, there are straight res state restrictions out there in terms of what you can ask employees. Not every state has it, but some do. And you might not be able to ask someone for their passwords or to make them a friend on their, make you a friend on their Facebook account, right? Some states do not allow that. So you need to make sure that human resources is the same way on an interview. There's certain questions you can't ask. There's certain things you can't demand once someone's an employee. You need to make sure you know what those restrictions are. Um, I think it's important to maintain a fraud plan. Um, you have a fraudster posed as an employee or wire fraud, whatever it may be. There's a lot of things that can happen on the internet with fraud. And I think it's important to go through them and make sure you are covered on them. IT security has got, has to be extended to social media. Um, incident response plan could be extended to social media, but you need your IT security on social media as well. Um, it's becoming more and more problematic um, as these con artists get better and better in what they do. Um, failure to monitor for complaints. As we all know, social media could be a forum for complaints. Yelp, Facebook, um, very important to monitor that, I think. Again, I don't know if it's as much as a compliant issue, but a compliance issue, but a reputational risk issue. You don't want people Googling your name and coming up with complaints, right? So that you can address them. You, want to, you have to know about them to address them. Very important to make sure that your employees are, are aware of not getting baited because it's it's very easy to get baited by irrational consumers or a consumer that has a, a bone to pick or a vendetta of some sort is to go back and forth with them and be baited in. Um, so you really want people to report this to your compliance officer, whoever you want to designate, um, so that you have a uniform response from the organization and not the response of one LO. Right. I think that's extremely important and extremely dangerous when you don't have a uniformed response and someone just goes back and forth because they don't take criticism well. It's, you know, it's you know what happens. You know, it could be your competitors that does it. Who knows? Right. But the idea is to, to not get baited and to and to come up with a uniform, well thought response on how you're going to deal with the issue. Um, and the last sin listed there is is targeted marketing um, and digital marketing and um, a lot of problems there now. Fair lending has come up. UDAP has come up. Um, you can just flip the page for a second. Um, it's, it's very, this is a very fluid area of the law right now. And I'm going to say this probably four times in the next three minutes. We are unlike any other industry. And you can't look at another industry and what they're doing and say, hey, let's do that in the mortgage industry. Some things you can, but some things you can't, right? You just can't. They look at LO comp. No other industry in the world has the LO comp restrictions that, that the mortgage industry has. It doesn't exist, right? But so you have to realize we're not like any other industry. So today, targeted marketed marketing strategies are designed, you know, 
to reach categories of consumers and 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 to keep the consumer anonymous, right, without them even knowing. So you have advertising platforms, you have Facebook, and they allow companies to use a, a, an incredible amount of consumer data to target marketing, right, in a really individualized manager manner. Um, and I'm not I'm not into this. I'm not a computer guy, but you know they they use very sophisticated logarithms um, as well, and which identifies people with the desired characteristics. And undeniably, these targeting certain demographics, and the results could be discriminatory, right? Um, it may be not intended, right? We all know it's 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 not intended, but. Targeting an audience by, you know, personal characteristics, the geography, hobbies, um, may classify users by prohibited characteristics, right? They may, they may characterize people by race, by national origin, or sex, all prohibited characters or, or trait characteristics under fair lending. So you have to be very, very careful of that and mindful, and not just you, but your lead generators, what they are doing, right? And again, this is something that you're going to read about more and more. Look, we read about the big Facebook, um, Facebook lawsuit that derived from targeted marketing and the settlement they made. This is really just evolving. But, um, you know, some of, with the screenshot here, you know, determine which users actually see a particular advertisement, right? You know, redlining is, is one of the taboos under fair lending, and redlining is a form of legal discrimination when, you know, an institution of some sort, a lender, provides unequal access to credit or unequal terms to credit. You know, and, it, and then they look at it and they say, well, is this based upon race, color, national origin, or another protected uh, group? And that can easily, you could see how that easily could happen from these targeted marketing complaint campaigns, internet campaigns. It very, very, and again, it could be dealing with price, right? The advertising, you know, may, the price may vary. And what the software companies have been able to do is truly amazing in terms of what they can follow people with hobbies and identifiers and, and when they go from one site to another using cookies. I mean, it's crazy what they can follow. But you just have to be very careful that that is not creating a fair lending problem where ultimately your targeted marketing is discriminating against the protected class. Um, I know that's not very specific because there's, you know, you really have to dig into what that algorithm is, but it's just something to be aware of, and especially when you deal with lead generators on how they are accumulating this information. And those formulas, algorithms, may lead to an undesired or unanticipated discriminatory result. And that is something that is very, very important. Understand the concept, and as it evolves, right, we can see what the particulars are and where regulators take issue. But understand conceptually, it's a real danger zone right there. Um, okay, I'm gonna flip this over to Dana uh, to go more on the practical side than the compliance side. Uh, Dana, it's all yours. Thank you, Mike. Wow, some interesting stuff, uh, kind of scary. So for the next half, the last half of the presentation, I'm going to share with you all M2Mars social media monitoring solution. Now there are multiple solutions out in the market. This is just one solution. This chart here represents one of our clients' accounts. In March, they had a 40% increase in social media posts. And we're actually seeing that trend across all clients' accounts. Now, I'm sure we're going to see similar results in April, if not worse, if not more posts. The obvious reason um, due to the increase is COVID-19. Loan officers are not able to meet with their referral partners and build relationships like they're used to. The only way they can connect and build interest is through social media. They're also probably bored, which is due to the increase in posts. Here on this slide are the top six social media sites used in general today. Now, when we take a look at these stats, we have figures in the millions and billions. Now, loan officers and mortgage-related advertisements are only a fraction of these figures, but it's still a lot. And without technology, it is very difficult to fully capture any company's social media exposure. So we believe automation equals confidence. 
MQMR's monitoring solution leverages technology to automatically capture loan officers' social media sites and their posts. The way it works is our the system, it, pull, it first pulls in all loan officers' social media sites that reference your company's name and any DBA. Then a user will sort through those sites and enable monitoring for sites that truly represent your organization. And the reason why we have to go through this process is to rule out any false positives. I can share with you a quick story. I had a client recently whose company's name was a common last name. And when we first launched their system, I received a lot of false positives. But I created a conditional rule and was able to solve that problem easily. Now, once you've enabled monitoring of specific sites, the system is now going to scrub those sites and capture potential violations through key trigger terms. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see sample trigger, trigger words. So we've got approval, approved, um, counsel, FPJ, sell an example, Fanny, um, loan. The trigger words are defaulted in the system, but you do have the ability to customize, add new trigger words. You can also, um, you can add as many as you like. You can remove some. And like I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can build conditional rules on these trigger words. So, for example, if you wanted to create a conditional rule that you only wanted to pull in social media posts that contain the word approval when it's combined with mortgage or loan, you can set that up. Now, on the right-hand side of the slide is a sample violation. The system captures the trigger word down payment, which you can see is highlighted in red at the top of the, of the image. Now, indicating the amount or percentage of a down payment, even zero down payment in this case, is a TILA trigger and requires disclosure of the APR and repayment terms, which Mike talked about earlier. Now, this post in particular is actually a double hitter. Um, located um, at the bottom of the picture, underneath this picture, is the property location and the link, which could be a RESPA violation, but I leave, uh, I would leave those, I'm going to leave those details to Michael Barone and the compliance experts. One thing that I also want to share that this system can do is it will automatically capture sites missing the NMLS ID, and it will pull that, um, pull that, those posts into a bucket so that you can easily review and make um, appropriate corrections. Once a violation is identified in the system, then the organization must work with the loan officer to correct the issue or take down the post. Now here's just a, um, some screen, you know, some screenshots, some images of social my, uh, media sites that we're integrated with today. We are uh, LinkedIn is currently in process. Now the system can also capture non-compliance related issues. It can capture posts that contain any inappropriate or profound language, any political references. Um, something that we recently added into the system. So Mike had talked about evolving social media monitoring. Um, we recently added the key trigger term forbearance to the system to monitor any unless unethical or misleading marketing efforts. And then the last thing I want to share with you, which isn't a compli um, client compliance issue, again, a non-compliance issue, it's more of an error that I often identify. I always find these issues during my live demos. The loan officer's website listed within their social media account is not updated or it's incorrect. Um, usually I see that the website listed in their social media account was the previous organization um, they worked for, so the previous lender. And the issue here is the consumer, you know, you see your social, the consumer sees your social media posts, they're interested, they click on the website contained in the social media site, and now it brings them to a different lender's um, website or a different lender's um, account. And then the last thing I want to share with you that our solution offers, which I view as a bonus, is customer service reviews. The system will pull in any customer service reviews, whether they are positive or negative. And you can reply directly to the reviews by clicking on the link within these posts. Um, this information is useful um, to potentially evaluate or provide feedback to your loan officers, or you can use it to complement your consumer complaints management program. And then, as Mike mentioned earlier, you can use it to manage. Uh, to, you, you can use this information to ensure that you've got a consistent, um, you've got consistent communication throughout your organization. And that is all I have to you have for you today regarding technology. I'm going to hand it back to TMC to open the floor for any questions.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael and Dana. Very informative discussion here. I um, already have some questions that have filtered in through the Q&A and chat functions, but want to remind our attendees, we've got about 10 minutes allocated, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, back and forth discussion. So encourage you to continue to submit those questions in and I will uh, voice those over to Michael and Dana. Um, so first question I have that came in is, if our logo is on social is on a social media graphic that isn't promoting a commercial message, say such as a holiday greeting, is that still considered advertising because of the logo? Uh, I would say no. I would say no. If you just had a, something that said Merry Christmas and the, or Happy New Year, and you had the logo on the, on the card, no, that would not be an advertisement. Um, you have to be careful, though, if something's stuck in. You know, I, I always use a very simplistic phrase, you know, call us for all your lending needs. Seems very, you know, very coy and nice, but probably is a, turns that into a commercial message. So a, a holiday card with your logo, wishing everyone a happy holiday, happy new year, and it says call us for our lending needs, you probably just turned into a commercial message. So you have to be careful of what you stick in there but just the logo, no. I would still recommend the NMLS number, um, but other than that, I would, I would say that there's no other advertising um, rules that you need to follow, state or federal. Gotcha, thank you, Michael. I've got a question for you, Dana. Um, within the, the demonstration display that you showed, is there a cap to the amount of trigger words that you can create at a given time on this platform? No, there is not. At least not today. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, Michael, back to you. I've got you know, a question. So if the font size in a disclaimer, say in a, a marketing piece, um, if that font size is, read is readable, can it be used in the well? Um, so I think that this is, is – there's a lot of discretion here, and it's somewhat subjective. I gave the example with the print advertisement being 14-point font and the, you know, disclaimer being four-point font. I was trying to be a wise guy and trying to really exemplify a point. It doesn't mean you can't have something 14-point font and 10-point font where it's legible. But we – you guys all know the, the disclaimers that you can't read – or you need a magnifying glass, or on a TV that you literally have to have your face plastered to the, the screen to be able to read them, right? Or, you know, a radio advertisement where they speak so fast, you don't even know what they're saying. So, or the bottom of a TV advertisement, the disclaimers go across, zoom in across the bottom of the thing, and there's no way you can read them, even if you wanted to. So the, it's very discretionary. It's very subjective. The idea is that, you know, you, you need, they need to be able to read them, you know, without a magnifying glass, without putting their face down to the desk to see them. Um, but you have some latitude there, but just, you know, be careful what you do. Of course, they're looking at those ones where, you know, it's really important what's said in the advertisement. And then the disclaimer has it buried into things. And, you know, there's, an argument to be said that hey the, the disclosure should be up where you where you set it right when you set a three percent rate why are you putting all the way in the bottom of the page or the next page or somewhere else on a link that that is with two discount points and a you know 50 ltv and you know um you know that, those types of things so just i i can't give a definite answer but just because you read it i don't think it makes it okay but it doesn't mean it has to be the same font as uh what you're primarily trying to uh, put forward in that advertisement. Appreciate that. I've actually had a couple different people ask a similar iteration of the same question. Um, wanting to know, Michael, what's your take on social media activity, likes or shares, um, you know, between loan officers or realtors? Well, this question probably comes from the RESPA concern. Um, I don't think there's any problem loan officer to loan officer liking an article or liking their Facebook page or a picture or anything. The question comes whether whether a like is a thing of value. Um, you know, so 
you know, again, mostly realtors, let's say, if realtors are trying to get people to like certain things, um, you know, is that a thing of value now that you are giving back to the realtor because they gave you a, a referral of a deal? I think the context is very important there. Yes, can it be on the, if you look at RESPA, could a like be a thing of value? Yes. But, you know, under RESPA, you have to prove that the thing of value was giving for a referral or anticipation of a referral. You can pay something of value all day long. You can refer all day long. You just can't pay something of value for a referral. So you, the connection has to be made there that that like was done because you received past referrals or with the hope of re uh, obtaining future referrals. And I have a hard time believing that in a rational context that just clicking like on something is going to is going to generate a referral or is a real big thank you for a referral. Again, there are it's all contextual. It's all context. If a realtor calls you and say, I sent you five deals last week, you better go like this on Facebook, it's obviously not good. You're you're connecting one to the other. But if you just happen to be sitting in your home one night and you see a realtor that sends you business and you're looking at their Facebook page and you like what they said and you click like, hard time believing that, that, that someone's going to be able to pin that together with uh, a RESPA violation that was for the referral. But with that said, I'll tell you that I don't think it's a bad practice for, for compliance people to say no likes um, to realtors or referral partners because it just opens up a can of worms and sometimes you give someone a little hole and they drive a truck through it. So, you know, you have to be careful and I don't think that that's a bad practice, but I also in the majority of the situations have a really hard time believing that a like is going to get you a referral. Appreciate that feedback, Michael. Dana, I've got a question for you um, specific to the platform. When using the system to respond to consumer comments or complaints, does it support various scripts to auto-populate or does it need to be added manually by the user? Oh, that's a great question. So does it so populate, the question was, does it populate various canned scripts? The answer is no. Um, right now, you do need to respond to the reviews um, on a single basis, but that is something I'm definitely going to forward to our developers to see if uh, maybe they can accommodate an enhancement in, fu in the future. It's a great question. Thank you, Dana. Um, question for Michael here. Thoughts on requirements for LO's personal Facebook pages, and more specifically, would you suggest that they add their NMLS number and company in the about section of a profile? Um, and then beyond that, what if their profiles are marked private and we can't see what advertising they're doing, if any? Yeah, so if you if you can't see it, you can't see it. The good news with that is that a regulator wouldn't be able to see it if it's private. So again, I don't. That's a that's a realization, and uh, you know I think it's good, but I don't know that you want to say go do anything because a real uh, a regulator can't see it. But that is a good result in that if you can't see it, a regulator can't see it. Um, it's very very difficult to give a one size fits all answer. Um, you know, New York, where I'm from is the the most difficult when it comes to social media right they they consider putting a loan officer puts the name of the place they work or the fact that they're a loan officer they are considering that a solicitation um and they're the only state that does that it's nuts it's crazy or a phone number they think that's a solicitation to me it's not i mean you're saying where you work and what your you know what your occupation is to say that's a solicitation is, is crazy maybe the phone number but it really depends upon what you're doing on that, what, what you're advertising, what you're doing. Um, the more information, the better. If you can put your, your MLS on, number on there and the company you work for, great. For some reason, there's a lot of pushback from that. And I don't know why. I don't know how that hurts you. But you should try and put whatever information you can on there to comply with the rules. And then once you have specific instances of a particular post, that may reference or may mandate some additional information, but it's it's a really a subjective type thing based upon what you are posting. There's a chance you need nothing. Again, 
If you do some of those things we talked about before, we're just putting articles up there or, or information um, as opposed to a commercial message. Um, I think that that's, you know, that, that is great. You don't have to put anything, but it really depends upon what your, what the content is. Thank you, Michael. And just a reminder to our attendees, first and foremost, really appreciate all the uh, questions coming in here. I'm running low on time, so I know we'll get a chance to get to all of them directly on the call, but I have captured everything that's come in so far. We will share what we don't get to address with both Michael and Dana uh, to be able to follow up following the discussion here. Um, let me look to try to get to one or two questions real quick. Um, Michael, just circling back kind of to the discussion of likes and sharing, do you foresee any issues with sharing house listings um, on behalf of a realtor? Um, is that question with respect to social media or no? Yes. Um, I think you have to look at the the rest, you know, the the rest for issues. Like, are you are you getting referrals from this person, and are are you giving them something of value by advertising their their homes, right? Advertising their homes to people you may know. I think that would be something of value. Now, if it's a joint advertisement, right, where you're also um, on there because you want to solicit the lending portion of the transaction, I think you're a lot better off. Um, straight sending realtor listings out, I think has a value to that realtor and could be looked at as a problem if you are getting referrals from that re realtor. Could be looked at as a you know something you're giving back to them. Again, fact specific, um, need to look at it, but I, I think that that's something that I would certainly look at in that context. They're giving you referrals, you're giving them advertising, they're not paying, right? So you have the characteristics of a potential RESPA violation. Not going to say everyone would be, but you'd have to dive into that a little bit deeper. Appreciate that. And then uh, last question we'll get to for today. Um, Michael, can a mortgage company create the business page for their MLOs and manage it for them to, I guess, you know, as a best practice to remain compliant? Yes and yes and yes. So they can, they should, and it's a great thing. I understand, I understand LOs. I understand that some of them are set in their ways. They want their own. They have a website they've had for 16 years, and they want to market themselves. What Tom suggested is the best way to do it. But, again, I understand I don't have to recruit and retain loan officers. Maybe some of you do. So it's not always you maybe can't set that bottom line, line draw a line in the sand there, and say it has to be a business page that the company uh, creates and manages, right? If you can, home run, but I understand it's not practical in every scenario. Excellent. Appreciate that feedback. And yeah, as we're running up on time here, <clears throat> first and foremost, Michael, Dana, I want to thank you both again for the invaluable insights shared on today's call. Um, as well as to our attendees for taking the time out to listen in here. And as a reminder, I see feedback coming in. We will have a copy of the recording and a copy of this slide deck to share back with our attendees uh, who joined us for today's discussion. Um, and again, we'll also uh, share the questions that we didn't get a chance to address directly on the call with Michael and Data uh, for any feedback that they can provide for our attendees today. Um, so, Michael, Dana, thank you so much both again. This is a fantastic discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone have a great day.